my name is Michael O'Sullivan, and we are very glad that you've decided to join us this morning. Uh, have you ever had a hard time making a difficult decision in life, whether to go right or to go left? This morning, we're going to start a series called Spiritual Mathematics, and you're going to hear from Harold the first time that he's preaching. Here at Life Song, uh, you're going to be hearing from God's Word about what to do in those situations when you don't know whether to go right or to go left. He's also going to be sharing some of his testimony and the decisions that he's had to make in his life and how he's made his way here to Life Song uh, to us. So we hope that you get something out of this message that can help you in your time of making decisions. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. And, uh, and I just want to introduce myself. I'm Pastor Harold Long. This is my wife, Susie. And this is our daughter, Emily. They're here with us. We'll, we'll show you more about them in a minute. But it's a thrill to be here. It's been a, a long journey to get here. And, uh, and uh, we, I tried to be engaged with, with, with the team and the leadership of your church as much as possible prior to getting here, just so we're off to a great start. And we've been able to do that. Mike's been fantastic. Janie's been fantastic. Uh, Brent's been fantastic. Steve, all the Steves, lots of Steves in this church. The <laughs> Steves have all been fantastic. So I appreciate all that. And really, I, I can't tell you enough how much it's meant to us to get here. It's uh, been a lot of planning and a lot of strategy, and it was really hard to leave our old place. We really weren't looking to leave our old place to come here. And uh, last last couple of weeks at our old congregation, uh, right before we left, we were going on a mission trip, and we were already eight hours into the mission trip, and we got a call that one of our rocks in the church, if you want to call it that, was tragically killed in a tractor accident. So we had to turn around and go back uh, from the mission trip and just a highly emotional week in that congregation, just a lot of pain. A 58-year-old man who was not only a rock in the church, but a rock in the community. And we had to go back and be there for them. And, uh, and then we had to lead a service and a wake, a wake that lasted nine hours. It was the longest wake in the history of that nursing home, or that funeral home. And then we had a, you know, just an unbelievable funeral on Thursday. So just a lot of things that got thrown in, our, in, in the wheel to uh, bring us to this point. Last week was our send off from there and it was, uh, they were just awesome. Awesome, awesome people. So they, they're praying for you, they're praying for us and, uh, and that's awesome and we're grateful for that. It's, uh, it's challenging because uh, you know, my journey here, when I, when I went up there, it, it wasn't really where they wanted to send me to start with, but we ended up there. And, uh, and I'll tell you more of that story in a little bit. But when it was time to come here and they called me out of the blue and they said, uh, the, the, the bishop, calls you know when the when the head guy calls you, you might want to pay attention to that right and uh and so we got an opportunity we got something that we really want you to think about doing and uh so we came up here and you guys were great you rolled out the car before us you were your generosity was great rob and rebecca were great the leadership team was great um so it made that discernment of god leading us here really easy and uh and i'll talk more about that here in a few minutes and what that discernment process looks like for all of us um but what I want you to, to know is I, when I met your previous pastor, Rob, for just the first two times we were together, I fell in love with the guy right off the bat, all right? And I will tell you that right off the bat. He's a great friend of mine. We became great friends. He texted me this morning, you know, right before I got up here. And uh, so uh, I don't ever want you to be afraid to hold back on stories about Rob and Rebecca and what that, that life and that story was for you. I mean, share those. It's something to celebrate. It's part of your history. It's part of your DNA. Um, great people, and they're gonna, God's going to do great things for them. Where they're going so just hang on to that with all your heart i mean really and uh we'll treasure them and they'll be a friends of ours for the rest of our lives so it's a it's a good chapter and uh and everybody said are you nuts you're going to go follow a, a pastor who planted the church i mean you got to be crazy and i said well if that's where the lord's going to send us we'll, we'll make it happen and again your hospitality to that has been great so i want to introduce you to our family i want to introduce you to these two but i just want to bring you into the context here and, and this is kind of going to be our outline for today. We're going to have our, our family introduction. I'm going to introduce you to my family and, and tell you a little bit about that. The journey, how we got here in total. Um, my testimony, I'm going to share with you my testimony, how I come to know the Lord, and, and, and so important to you know that. And uh, an outline for the rest of this series on spiritual mathematics. And then how we're going to break the ice for the rest of 2018. So that's the things that we're going to look at. But this here is a picture of my entire family. I know it's hard for you to see uh, that, but on the left, there's two ladies in that there, thank you. That first lady is Shirley, and that's my mother-in-law, Susie's mom. And that next lady is my mom, who passed away in 2015. But my mom was the rock in my life, um, and I'll talk away a lot about moms. Uh, the next two is, is my son-in-law, Sam and Danielle. They live in Houston, Texas. And uh, Danielle is a school teacher there. Sam works for a, 
a big oil company uh, called Boomerang. And uh, he got that job while going to school in St. Louis and caddying at a, at a pretty upper echelon uh, uh, golf course. And, the, and he got a job out of it. So that, that he moved down there. The next girl sitting next to me is Sarah. Sarah lives in St. Louis. She's almost ready to graduate as a uh, respiratory therapist. And making a circle, that's Brandon, who just turned 30 with a big cheesy smile there. And, St. Louis, and Susie just got back from uh, St. Louis. And, they, you know, and uh, we're going to sell it. Well, he's going to be 30. He's coming up in October. But he's, uh, he's pretty cheesy. He lives, in, uh, he lives in St. Louis, has a condo. Single, by the way, just so you know. In the, uh, <laughs> and uh, so you might be able to lure him here. Give him the right perfume, I guess. The next daughter is Nicole, which she'll be here in a little bit with her really persistent boyfriend. He's really trying to become a member of the family. He's from England, so he talks funny when he gets here. So if you get to meet him, you know what I'm talking about. And of course, we have Emily. Uh, but this is our family. And uh, it's not a giant family, but it is our family. Uh, I'm surrounded by girls, as you can see. It's God's way of getting even with me. And, uh, and, uh, and be careful what you pray for, right? But, uh, but here's Emily, and this is our dog, Coda. Coda's about almost two years old. She's a black lab, and, uh, and she's awesome. And uh, she's a handful, but she's made the adjustment. We have a big backyard with a privacy fence, so she's happy about that. But she's, but she's awesome. And, of course, Emily's here with us. And then, of course, we have Nicole and Knight. Um, this is her dog, who's uh, here with us as well this week. We got the benefit of having both of them with us. Our kids are grown, so they're scattered, and school takes them a lot of different places, so we don't get to spend a lot of time with them. So when we have them, we really appreciate it. But you'll meet her here in a little bit. This is Brandon, as I told you about. And this is uh, Sarah, Miss Sarah. And this is Danielle and Sam. Sam is really tall, Danielle, so it looks like, you know, it looks like jumbo shrimp is what it looks like, <laughs> right? That's what that looks like. And of course, there's Grandma, Mama Shirley, and uh, and and here's our journey. I mean, and this is what I want to talk about. This is how I got to here, and, the, and it's always a story. There's always a story to it. Um, in 1993 is really where I went into ministry on a bivocational basis, but I went in in prison ministry, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that story to tell my testimony. But I've been involved in pr prison ministry since 1993, and I still do that almost on a weekly basis. Always been in maximum security penitentiaries. Uh, as I move here, I'm going to be moving to OCC, uh, which is a much lower uh, level custody prison, but I'll be involved with that. So this is something God put on my heart, it's something I've been doing for almost 30 years now. Um, so it's a, it's a great deal. 2012 to 2016, uh, coming out of Morningstar Church, which is one of the largest Methodist churches uh, in, in Missouri, uh, we planted a new church called the Word at Shaw. And it's a, a multicultural church right at the corner of Shaw and Tyler Road, if you're familiar with St. Louis, uh, right by Botanical Gardens. We planted that church about seven years ago. Still doing great today with Pastor Keith. And then, uh, and then we left there, and that's when, we, when I sold my last business. I've been blessed to be in buying businesses and selling businesses, mainly in the insurance industry, for the last 30 years. So I bought and sold my last business in 2015 and decided... Uh, you know, God been pulling on my heart, and I'll tell you more about that later, but God been pulling on my heart since I was this tall to be in ministry. So we, Susie and I had to discern over that and make that decision if we were going to really go that direction. And so we did. We prayed about it. We made a decision. And what happened was when we made a decision, who, is our, who, who now is our bishop was at that point in time in charge of church planning. So he wanted me to leave and plant a church. That's what he wanted me to do. I mean, he was dead set on it. Hell, I want you to go plant a church. You can go pretty much where you want. We'll get behind you, figure it out. And uh, so we prayed about that. Uh, and I really just didn't feel called to go do that at that time. Um, the next step was to stay where we were at and continue to work on the word at Shaw uh, or stay inside the Morning Star family. And then I said, but I asked the, the, the question they didn't want me to ask. And I said, well, what else is there? What else do you have outside of that? And they said, there's an opportunity in Northeast Missouri. And they lay that on us. So we had to discern over these three things. And we'll talk about how we discern over that process. It's really going to be part of our message today. But ultimately, we made that choice to go there. And we knew going there that we probably wouldn't be there very long. And when our now bishop became the bishop, I knew that our number was going to be really short there. And, and of course, they wanted to move me last year. They didn't tell me that till this year. But here we are. And they, and they brought us here. And uh, so we're here. And it's going to be a journey. It's going to be fun. And it's going to be a, a lot of fun. I, I'm a... I love the Lord with all my heart, and I love going out into the kingdom and doing the work. It's great to be able to go up here and quote Bible verses and talk scripture and do all these things, but it's really about doing. It's not about hearing. And I'm, I'm a doer guy, and you'll find that out real quick in, uh, in the circles that I run in and the things that I do. So, because that's what's changed my life. 
when, you, when God brings two people together, he doesn't bring them together, just help one of them, right? Amen? Amen. Right, so it's, uh, so it's that kind of work, and that's really what I'm about. Um, so we made the choice to come up here, and, uh, and we're glad we're here. It's been a process these last four weeks. We were here on June the 4th, but getting here has been a, been a trip. We still got boxes everywhere we're still trying to unpack. This week, being a holiday week, hopefully we'll accomplish most of that. But again, I can't, I can't express um, the excitement we are to be here, the leadership team that we met. Uh, it's going to be a great time, and, uh, and I, I'm very approachable, I'm very reachable. If you look inside your next six-day challenge, right on the beginning of the page, the very first page, is our contact information. So you know, that's how you get a hold of us. This is my address, it's my phone number, it's my email address, Susie's information is on there. You can text us, you can call us, you can email us, you can visit us, um, you can hook up with us on social media, whatever works for you. I mean, we're, I'm been plugged in about everywhere you can be plugged in at. And, uh, so take advantage of that. Now you see there today is national, a lot of things day, but today is international joke day. So, uh, you know, I don't know if you have a joke for, uh, for the holiday season, 4th of July is coming up. Um, but you know why there's no America knock knock jokes? Anybody? Because freedom rings. No. Oh, there you, go. You, you can use that one. I want royalties off it if you use it. Or you can see, or you can use this one. See the guy with the eye pass and three fingers? He sells the best fireworks in Stone County, right? You can, <laughs> you can use that one too. But uh, have fun with it. But it, it's a lot of fun. And we're going to have a good time. My education, just, you know, who am I and how did I, how, what's my education? I went to uh, Missouri Baptist University, did my undergrad professional business studies there, did my MBA there as well. Um, I had, got very educated in the world of insurance and financial services and uh, have seven professional designations in that area and just finishing up uh, a, another master's degree in divinity at Eden Seminary which I'm in the process of right now. So heavily educated as they would say, right? And uh, you take all those degrees and all those initials and 50 cents and you can buy yourself a cup of coffee at Starbucks, yeah. It's a good time. Yeah, 50 cents. But, uh, but this is what we're going to talk about today. So how do you discern? How do you make a big choice? Because many of you are making choices. Many of you uh, have finished school. Uh, maybe you're getting ready to go off to school this coming year. Uh, maybe it's a job change. I know people are moving in. People are thinking about buying a business, buying a house. How do, you, how do you discern over something? How do you know what is God's will in your life? And that's a great question. So these are four key points that we're going to look at. So if you have your, your Bibles with you, let's open up to uh, Proverbs. Go right off the bat to Proverbs. And uh, we're going to be in Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6. And uh, let's read that. It says, Trust the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Man, that's key right there, right? Because my buddy Henry says it all the time. My life is great as long as I'm not involved in it. Right? <laughs> and it's really true. So, so I always got to know that I, I need somebody that's not emotionally involved in my life. To lean on and, and of course God uh, is that understanding in all your ways submit to him and he, and he will make your past straight just a tremendous promise right off the bat so right away I know that I'm going to lean on God I'm going to be listening for God's voice to speak into my life and it may not happen right away there may be work for me to do in order to hear God's voice uh, he may have stuff laid out for us to do that I need to do so those are things that we need to think about number one I got to be sold out that it's God's will thy will not mine be done it's got to be uno number one as we go through that. The next one is if you jump with me over to Romans, go over to the book of Romans. Let's go to book t Romans 12, 3 is where we're going to be at. And Romans 12, 3 says, Therefore I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, God's going to speak into us, and I believe if you want to have a potato farm, you better bring a hoe, right? If God will move mountains for you, but you better bring a shovel. And it's just part of how it works. And so this Ben Franklin inventory, I do it on anything decision I'm going to make in my life. I do it every time. So when we had a choice to what we were going to do in ministry, go plant a church, stay where we were at, or go up to northeast Missouri, right away we just took a piece of paper and we drew a line down the middle, and it was pros and cons. What are the pros of doing this? What are the cons of doing this? And just started writing that. And it had people outside ourselves add to that list. And that list alone will start to show you do the, do the pros outweigh the cons on these decisions. It's a great tool to help us. And, and knowing that the Holy Spirit can speak through that and, and, and engaging wise counsel. So as, as we go back over to Proverbs 24, 6, 
and we jump to Proverbs 24, 6, and it says to us, Surely you need guidance to wage war, and victory is won through many advisors. Now, who do you have in your life who speaks truth into your life? Do you have that one person? Do you have a mentor, someone that, you just, that you're totally accountable to each and every week of your life, maybe daily, that can speak truth into your life? I can tell you that segment of my life is the most important part of my journey. I have a mentor. I speak to him every Tuesday at 8 o'clock. I have other people in my life. I, I mentor dozens and dozens of guys um, in, in my life. I hear from them every single night. We do a nightly review together of our day and what's going on in our life. Um, it's just an important part of my life. So seeking wise counsel is imperative to make good choices. It's also imperative to keep this darkness that exists between our ears at bay because the dark side will never fully go away and the problem centers in our mind. This is where it rests. And so having these tools helps uh, is a way to discern. It, 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 so even making that choice and laying it out in front of my advisors and saying, no, this is an opportunity before us, speak truth into our life, declare truth into our life. Give us the pros and cons outside of ourselves because we need people that are not emotionally involved in our life. And then the last place we're going to go to this morning on that is Jeremiah 29, verse 11. And you can go with me there. And it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek with me all your heart. And that is really the key. Um, am I a true seeker? A lot of this lust for God's blessing. We want God's blessing in our life, but am I really seeking God's will for my life? And then am I willing to humble myself for it and take the next steps on my spiritual journey? That's really the key. Am I willing to do those things? And that's what, uh, that's what we're challenged to do. So all of us have big decisions to make in life. We will for the rest of our life. Um, tough decisions. Tough decisions to do with our parents, our kids, our own health, our own life, our own welfare, uh, where we're going to do spiritually, where do we go next, do I join this group, do I serve here? All those things come into play, and how do you know where God wants to lead you? And there's a process for it, and there's a process to discernment. It's not just going to bed with your fingers crossed, hoping tomorrow is better than it was today. It's important to have a process. So. This is how I go about any major decisions, how I went about making the decision to come here. It was not an overnight decision. It went on for several weeks, several months, and it was really clear that this is where God wanted to, to lead us. And so that's why we're here. And I know, I, so when I come here, it's not, I hope this works out. I hope this is where God wants us to go. I know it's exactly where God wants us to go. And uh, he hasn't spoke anything to us. And, uh, and, and uh, even though I wasn't really looking to leave where we were at, this is where God wants us. And if you're in ministry of any kind, whether you're a lay person uh, or you're a full-time clergy, your life is not your own. You know, you're, you're called to go wherever God sends you and trust that it'll be great. So uh, it's important. So that's how I discern. That's how I made the decision to get to where we're at today. So I want to share with you now my own testimony. And then you can see the scripture up there, Luke, and we go to the Gospel of Luke. And it says, return home and tell the story of what God has done for you. That's what we're all commissioned to do. Right? Every one of us. So he went out through Stone County and the surrounding territories proclaiming what he had, Jesus had done with him. That really doesn't say Stone County. It says, but it does, in a sense. But my story is really simple. It's, a, it's kind of a tragic, tough story, to be honest with you. Uh, I was raised by a single mom born in Nevada, Missouri. Uh, my mom uh, had two relationships with alcoholics that were both really alcoholic and really abusive in her life. And... Uh, she left the first marriage, had a son and two daughters out of that marriage, and then she married another guy that happened to be my dad. My mom had a nervous breakdown after that first marriage and spent almost, um, probably close to five years in a, in a state mental institution in Nevada, Missouri, until she got well enough to get out. When she got out, she gave her life to the Lord, and she never looked back from that day till now. She met my dad. It lasted about two, two years. I came out of that marriage, and she, it was going down the same path, and then she fully committed herself. She asked him to leave, and it was just my mom and I. Grew up with no education, no grandparents, no uncles, no aunts, nobody. It was just my mom and I. My mom was every aspect of family that you could be. But she loved me with all her heart. There's two things my mom did for me. She told me she loved me almost every day of my life. And she instilled in me Jesus Christ. Those are the things that she tried to put into my life. Other than that, we struggled. I mean, we shared a bathroom with the lady next door for a couple of years in my life. We just didn't have a lot of resources. She put money together. She brought me up at a Catholic school through kindergarten through fourth grade. 
And I was one of those guys that went to church, to mass every day, and I loved it. Loved everything about mass. I used to come home and play church. I'd get out the TV trays and put a towel over them. You know, I'd take the fruit out of the fruit bowl and dump it out, full, full of potato chips for the, for, the, for the Eucharist. I would get great Kool-Aid out for the, for the, the wine. I throw some towels over my shoulder. I get the Bible out. I bring some saps, pour saps over, and save a few souls that day. You know, and we'd play church. We do that every once in a while. Church never lasts long when you use potato chips for the Eucharist, right? <laughs> but, but, but the incentive was there. I was moved by that. That was when the rock operas were going off, and Tommy was out, and, and Jesus Christ Superstar, and Hair, and Godspell. And I could still today sing God's, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar backwards and forwards for you. I mean, I just it had a major impact on my theology, had a major impact on my life. We moved to the suburbs of St. Louis as my mom tried to heal with my brothers and sisters, which I didn't even know existed until I was almost eight years old. Didn't even know I had a brother and two sisters. We moved to a suburb. I got taken out of the private school, put into a public school, and I was introduced to the dark world that we live in. I was pretty much sheltered from that that whole time. And I got there, and even though I had Jesus on my heart, I was, I was no... Uh, at that point in time, I was no competitor for the dark side. And the dark side stuck its teeth in me, and I went off in a, in a dark path, which involved tobacco, it, it involved drugs, it involved alcohol. And that lifestyle put its teeth in me and just drug me into the streets. And I pretty much grew up an orphan from that point on. I mean, I left home when I was 15 years old. I quit school when I was 13. I was in and out of juvenile detention centers as a youth. Um, I was, again, I was on the streets by the time I was 15. And, uh, and I got in a lot of trouble, and I'm really just giving you the PG version of this. But at age 21 is when this theology that my mom put into my heart saved my life. In a, in a jail cell, on my knees, and in a total posture of surrender. It was probably the most honest posture and surrender I've ever had in my life. And I simply put my hands out, and I asked God to come into my life in that jail cell. And from that day, as I stand here today, my life's never been the same. I never drank another drop of alcohol. I never did any more drugs. And the tobacco came quickly behind it. And I've lived a pretty awesome life for the last 31 plus years uh, with Jesus in my life. Um, you know, my journey through life is where spiritual mathematics comes in. So what is spiritual mathematics? Grab your six day challenge and look at this for a minute. There's, two, there's three definitions there. They're on the very first page. It says mathematics, the abstract science of number, Quantity in space. Mathematics may be studied in its own right, that's pure mathematics, or as it is applied to other disciplines such as physics and engineering, applied mathematics. And then you have the word spiritual, relating to or affecting the human spirit or soul as opposed to material or physical things. But this is my own definition, but this is spiritual mathematics. The miraculous mystery affecting the human soul and outcomes in life when the divine supernatural acts of God make the worldly impossible spiritually possible because everything is possible with God. Two plus two doesn't equal four. That, the impossible become possible. There's many of you sitting here today that got hardships going on. It's, it's, it's a tough place. And uh, as I explained to Michael, and if I had a pen and drew this out, I could simply take this piece of paper, if this is a blank piece of paper, and draw all three columns. One column I could title it church, Next column, I could title it small group. And the next column, I could title it mentor. But let's just take, you know, an ugly sin that, that affects a lot of people. We'll just take pornography, for example. If there's somebody sitting in our room today with us right here in service struggling with pornography, using this first column, which is labeled church, do you think they're going to share that in this room? So they come with their 150 pound bag or whatever it is they're carrying in their life and they leave it at the front door and they come in. Listen, Brianne sang, let's pray, the prayer group pray, sing some great praise songs, listen to me talk. Maybe get motivated a little bit, maybe get moved a little bit, maybe shed a few tears, but then they walk right out the door and they grab their bag and they head back to their car. Even in a small group, which probably less than 40% of the people in this room are in it, even a part of a small group, I would be willing to guess because that's the natural trend. But even in a small group, do you think that person is really going to bring it out? Maybe, possibly, but most likely not. So they're even going to go to their small group with that stuff on their heart and stuff in their life, and then they're going to leave without it. But if they had a mentor, a one-on-one -on -one engagement with somebody that knew their life forwards, backwards, every aspect of their life, somebody that could, they would allow to speak truth into their life, somebody that's not emotionally involved in their life, financially involved in their life, who could speak truth into their life, do you think that person would share that 
with them. You bet. Amen. So I, I can promise you most of you don't have mentors in your life. Some of you, and the vast majority don't belong to a small group, and most of you show up here on Sunday. So as your pastor, something I'm going to be challenged all to do is to get to this part of the mathematics. Because here's the mathematics. The mathematical formula is simply this. If you put the spiritual before everything else, you'll straighten out mentally, you'll straighten out physically, you'll straighten out financially, you'll straighten out in every aspect of your life. But the problem is we live by worldly mathematics. I need a few more hundred dollars in my pocket, and then somehow or another I'm going to get better. Call me crazy. It made sense to me when I was stuck in it that a few hundred dollars would make you a little bit more happy. You know, it just made sense. That's what the world says. But I had to, somewhere along the line, this mathematical formula had a shift in my life, and I had to start trusting because I had this dark voice in my life who just spoke into my life, most of my life, to the point all I had in my heart was discouragement. There's an old story about the devil had a yard sale one day, and he had his table out, and he had everything for sale. He had all seven deadly sins, lust, power, you know, all the way down, gluttony, sloth, anger, fear, pride leading the procession. And he had patrons coming back and forth looking at everything on the, on the table. But on the back table, he had something else. And the patron says, well, what do you got on the back table? He says, well, don't worry about it. It's not for sale. He goes, well, what is it? He goes, just don't worry about it. I'll make you a heck of a deal on all this stuff. But this is not for sale. He says, and he's just so persistent. He goes, well, what is it? He goes, all right, I'll tell you what it is. It's discouragement. And he goes, why don't you sell that? He says, because I win more souls over with that than all this other stuff put together. So it's not for sale, right? And that's what happens to so many people. So many people, there's people sitting here this morning, I promise you, that are discouraged in their heart. They've already given up. When you walk into a penitentiary, I sit with rooms with these guys. They're, they're, they're just, they're, they've got a discouraged heart and they've already given up. So how do you uncover that? Well, you have to change the mathematics. You have to change the entire mathematics. And so that's what happens in our life. So that's what happened in my life. I had mentors stepping into my life at age 21 who started to mentor me. They got me to take, st they got me to take actions I didn't believe in. And that's the hardest thing you're ever going to do in your life when you're working with somebody that you're mentoring in life. Somebody that you're not going to get in front of, but you're going to stand side by side with them. And eventually you're going to get behind them and you're going to walk with them and help them take the next steps on their spiritual journey. Right? And the hardest thing you can do is get people to take actions they don't believe in. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. But when you can do it and you can watch the mathematics take place, amazing things can happen. And I've had that opportunity, to, not in this hundreds, but into the thousands now of guys that I've mentored over the years. Uh, and it's an amazing journey. But I can tell you this, mathematics is the truth. So I don't know, so, so many people were hung on that. If I, if I just had the right girlfriend, if I had more romance in my life, a different kind of romance in my life, a better romance in my life, a better job, a bigger house, uh, you know, list goes on and on of all the stuff that the world throws at us and says, if you have this, then you're going to be happy. And I'm just telling you, that's not going to ever make you happy. Temporary it will. It's great to get a new car until the new car smells off. You know how it goes. You get a new car, you're not going to smoke in the car, you're not going to drink in the car, you're not going to eat in the car, you're not going to do any of that stuff. And then six months later, you got pickles under the floorboard, onions under the seat, right? <laughs> do you all have white castles? Anybody ever had a white castle? Oh, Same yeah. tradition, right? Those little onions that are on there, right? <laughs> and those, even six months later, when you clean out your car and you find one of those little onions, they taste just as good then as they did <laughs> all the way back then, right? So... But that's what happens to us. We get something more, and then, we, then the more is just going to make you more of what you already are. If you really want to change, if you really want to see where God takes off in your life, you've got to change the mathematics. And so that's my encouragement to you is, is to really think about the mathematics. And, and so you've got to get the spiritual first, and then you straighten out in every aspect of your life. It's just the truth. But it's hard to maintain. It's hard to keep, in, keep on that equation. And that's where mentorship, small group, and just having a circle of influence in your life that uh, is there to hold you accountable, to motivate you, inspire you, encourage you, to speak truth, declare truth in your life, is so imperative. So I don't know where you're at on your spiritual journey, but that's just who I am and where I came from. And again, I'm giving you the PG version, but some of the exciting stuff that can come out of that, in 1996, we were doing some stuff inside the prison group, and I had three guys, you know, or well, more than that, we had but six particular guys but I had six guys that all had life sentences or more, and this one kid named Brent was in our group. And Brent uh, grew up not far from here, grew up in Lebanon, Missouri. He grew up with a lot of pain in his life because he had a very abusive dad. He abused his mom, he abused him, and every aspect of his life. And it went on for his whole life. And the resentment built, and the resentment built, and the resentment built, and the hate built, and eventually turned to hate, and eventually turned to bitterness, and eventually he ended up taking his dad's life. And he got sentenced to two life sentences, second-degree murder 
and aggravated assault. I met Brent in 1996. He came into our group and we started this journey together. And we had a, a tremendous ride. But to get him to take the next steps, because here's the, here's the deal with offenders, when they come into the meeting for six months, they'll sit like this. And why? Because they listen with their eyes and they think with their feelings. Let me say it again, they listen with their eyes and they think with their feelings. So they watch to see if you're authentic. Are you really who you say you are? But after six months, they, you were able to get them to start taking actions they didn't believe in. And this watch spiritual mathematics take place in their life. Because when God's got work for you to do, the walls come down. And two plus two doesn't equal four. Right? God's got to do something with you on the inside before he can ever do anything on you, through you on the outside. And, and so these guys so much wanted to be able to do stuff, but they just hadn't healed at all through the inside. So we helped them heal that process. And when that did, the mathematics started happening. And all of a sudden, the impossible became possible. And in 2006, Brent came in and he had a smile that wrapped all the way around his head. I said, what are you so excited about? He says, you're never going to believe it. I said, what's that? He said, I got an outdate. I said, you got an outdate? He goes, yeah, I'm going home in 2008. Now, when I met Brent, his mom wouldn't come see him anymore. His grandma wouldn't come see him. His wife had divorced him. By this time, his mom and grandma were back in his life, and uh, his wife had renewed her vows with him. Things were working out because his life was changing. So in 2008, he called me, and I said, well, you call me every day when you walk out of prison. So he called me in 2008, and he, and he says, hey, man, I'm out, and I'm on this thing called a cell phone. <laughs> I, said, I said, pretty cool, Brent, but I've had one for about 10 years. But it's... I'm glad you like the shock and all that. I said, you just call me every day until I tell you not to call me. And the next day, he called me, about 9.30 in the morning. He says, you're never going to guess what I'm doing. And I said, well, I mean, you've been gone for 21 years, exactly. 21 years he did. He says, well, I've been opening gifts all morning. I said, you've been opening gifts? I said, what kind of gifts? Welcome home gifts? He goes, no, man, I've been opening Father's Day gifts, birthday gifts, and Christmas gifts since 1996. And he says, you're never going to guess what I got for Christmas of 87, or 97. <laughs> and I said, what did you get? He said, I got a Miami's Dolphin jacket. Now, I know most of you, some of you are Bronco fans here. Uh, yeah, we'll be praying for you. We'll be having some, some get the evil out of you on that. But, uh, but he was a Dolphins fan, and I don't know why. He'd never been in an NFL game in his life. He just liked the Dolphins. But this, this is the mathematics. Because somebody had already given me four tickets to give to him to watch the, the Dolphins play the Rams and four weeks later in St. Louis before he, he even told me that story. And I said, well, I got four tickets for you to go to the game to add to your gift. He says, that's awesome. He goes, who am I going to take? I said, you take whoever you want. He says, we'll take Bob, who had life in 45. We'll take Gary, who had life in 20. And we'll take you. The four of us will go to the game. Now think about that. Here we are sitting there eating pancakes at a pancake house. All these guys, they live this life. Their lives have changed. God's come into their life. God's changed their hearts. The, the walls come down. And these guys are all successful people today. If they came to church, you would not know they spent 30 seconds in jail, much less combined, probably close to 100. We went to the game. We had a time of our life. We were laughing, cutting up. Couldn't even believe we were having this experience. And at halftime, the lady in front of us turned around and says, man, you guys are having a great time. I said, yeah. And she goes, you know what's crazy? You guys aren't even drinking. I said, I know. She goes, it's a good thing. I said, why is that? She goes, because you guys probably end up in prison or something. <laughs> right? Same, right? But that's the mathematics, folks. And uh, so I don't know where you're on a spiritual journey, but I tell you that God wants to meet you where you're at. And, uh, and I, as your pastor, and in your, lay, in your laity and your leadership teams, we want to meet you where you're at and help you take the next steps on your spiritual journey. And that 150-pound bag of stuff, whatever that is in your life, we want to help you deal with that. Um, there's no blue ribbons hanging on any of our walls. But I'm telling you, that's what's going to change your life. But you, somewhere along the line, you've got to change the mathematical formula. And when you do, it's going to change your life. And, uh, and we just want to be a part of that. Because I want you to come to church. I want you to give everything you can, your talents, your treasures, your gifts, your ideas. I want you to be poured into your church. I really do more than anything. But I know what's going to change your life. Coming here and doing service is great, but it's, it's when you're out there in the field doing true mission, when your life has been totally healed and you're connected, that's where the magic, that's where the spiritual mojo comes into place. And there's nothing better than that in your life. I don't care who you are and where you're at on your spiritual journey. So we want to help build on that. For the, for the rest of the year, you know, it's just icebreakers. It's you getting to know me and Susie and, uh, and us getting to know you. So that's what we're going to be doing. And I know uh, Janie's already been working on that. Uh, groups of 8 to 10, you know, meeting over food whether it's in your homes or your restaurants or your small groups or how we want to do that, but we just want to meet and we just want to get to know you and, uh, and, and so you get to know us. 
uh, ministries outside the walls of the church and we're going to be leading with all the leadership teams that do ministries outside of here or even ministries they bring into here and uh, seeing where you're at and seeing what, mainly how we can help you know and, and, and better that fellowship just doing fellowship and really ultimately it's just about love and service which you guys have poured out on me in a big way and I'm forever grateful for that already to start that journey but that just tells you a little about who I am and uh, what I'm about so this is where we're going to be going um, oh I got to tell you about rule seven I have an African-American lady friend of mine named Serena. And Serena, anytime you see Serena, she'll tell you, are you having fun yet? That's her big phrase. And, she, and, she's, and a big old smile wraps around her head. It's awesome. So one day I was with Serena, and she asked me, she said, you having fun yet? I said, I have fun, especially when I'm around you. I said, what's your favorite number? She said, seven. I said, well, we're going to make a new rule. Rule number seven, have fun. So I don't know where you're at on your spiritual journey, but I hope you implement rule number seven in your life and learn to not take yourself too seriously, to have a little fun and enjoy it uh, in a big way. And uh, in a minute, we're going to do communion together. And you see this table up here. I know you're not used to this table up here, but I like to talk about this in a big way um, because it's a big deal. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, would have us doing communion every time we even had a meeting together, more or less church together, just to celebrate the sacrament together. It's a holy thing. Like I said, there's a lot of people here that uh, are really sold out for Christ in their life. And I'll get to know you as we go along. There's some of you that need to make a recommitment to Christ that are sitting here today. And there's some of you that may not have a relationship with Christ whatsoever here today. I don't know where you're at in your spiritual journey, but here's what I do know. All you got to do is watch the paper, look on the internet, watch TV, Fox, NBC, any of those stations, to know that the world is a dark place, that there's pain all over the place that people are suffering all over the place. There's school shootings, just had another work shooting. There's crime everywhere. You know, you got the Me Too movement. You got all these things going on in the world, just out of control world. And, uh, and when you're out there as an agnostic or an atheist, you're sitting there going, well, you know, if God is in charge of everything, why does he allow all this evil to happen? If he's in charge, why can't he just step in and stop it? You know, we have all, if he's pain, why don't you just take my pain away? Why don't you just take my 150 pound bag of stuff away? If he's all powerful, why not? But before you ask all those questions, maybe you need to ask this question. Why did Jesus have to die? Why did a guy who never did anything wrong have to give up his life? Why did a guy who never did anything wrong have to be lied about by his own people? Be spat upon? Be tortured? have two inch thrones stuck into his head, be whipped with nine different belts 39 times to rip the flesh off his bones, and then asked to carry his own cross up a hill. And he carried that cross up to the top of the hill, and he got up there and they pounded nails through his hands and his feet. And then he hung him on a cross for six hours until his heart exploded in his chest. He actually, you can actually say Jesus died from a broken heart. And all this for a guy who never did anything wrong. But let me tell you why he did it. The Bible says that we've all fallen short. As sinners, we've fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 5.8 basically tells us that Christ died for our sins. That Christ gave up his life for us. Why? Because he loves us. Because it was God's doing. God, had to, God was the only one that could fix it. So Jesus stepped into our life with a free will and a free choice. He chose to give it all. To pay it all for you and for me. So that we can not only be, have eternity and be free, but we can be free from the stranglehold and the slavery of sin in our lives. And that's the beauty of it. And that's, that's why he did it. So we can be free from that. So we can be in oneness with God. God created us to enjoy God. So I don't know where you're at in your spiritual journey, but if you're here today and you haven't made that commitment to Christ, I'm going to pray in a minute. And I just ask you to pray this prayer in the middle, in the privacy of your heart. And if you believe it, and the key is if you truly believe and ask God to come into your life, Ask him to forgive you of your sin and to take over your heart, to be the director of your life. You know, you can be on your way to this new formula called spiritual mathematics in your life. And we want to help you with that process. And if you're just lost and been struggling for a while, maybe it's just time to make a recommitment. But as I invite us to come to communion, because that is the biggest part of this. And this is why communion is a big deal. Because Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, on the night that he had his last supper, he took the bread and he gave it to his disciples. He broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples. And he gave thanks for it. Right? And he gave thanks to God. And he, he told his disciples, he goes, each time you meet, I want you to do this in memory of me. Do it. 
And so that's why we come together. Methodists don't necessarily have an altar call. Our altar call is really communion. So when you come up and partake this morning and take, partake in communion, I really think, want you to think about where you're at on your spiritual journey and the kind of commitment that you really need to make to, to the person who paid it all for your life, right? That's where we're all at. So that's, communion is a big deal. After the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave the cup to his disciples. And he said, drink and give thanks for the forgiveness of sins for many for, and do this as often as you meet. So we use juice. We don't use wine. We use juice. Why? Mainly today in the 21st century, we use juice for our friends in recovery. But that's not really the whole story. The real story of that is Mrs. Welch, back to the grapefruit juice, was a diehard Methodist. She was a United Methodist woman, big time during Prohibition times. True story. During the Prohibition times. And so they were in this, you know, there they are making wine and, and they're this time. And Mrs. Welch is like telling her husband, you need to make something that doesn't have alcohol in it. And today that's how we got Welch's grapefruit juice came into play. And it was a good old Methodist that did it. God bless the Methodist women, right? <laughs> yeah. But that's why we use... Uh, Welch's grapefruit juice. That's why we use non, why we don't use wine. But today, really in context, it's for our friends in recovery to honor that. And there's many of those people, myself being one of those people. So I'm going to invite the, the band here in a minute to come up and, and to go ahead and partake in communion. Um, and then they're going to come up and they're going to play. And then you're going to have your chance. You know, you'll be dismissed. And uh, I think we worked this section, Michael, if I'm correct, we worked this section goes around this way. You kind of know the drill. This section goes this direction. So with that, let's, uh, let's just pray over our communion. Heavenly Father, in your holy mystery way, we know that you are present with us. We know that you are part of our bread and our juice this morning. And we know as the sacrament of communion comes into our hearts, that there's a real purpose for that. And it's a time for us to confess whatever is going on in our life to you privately. But it's also a time for us to share our gratitude for what you've done in our life. And it's also time for us to recommit ourselves to you a little more than what we have been. So, Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit be in each and every one of us this morning. Guide our hearts, convict us, and help us to walk out of service today just a little better than we walked in. It's in your name we pray these things. And all God's people said, Amen. All right. Isn't it awesome how God, when we put Him first in this spiritual mathematical equation, all the other aspects of our life can fall into place. He can speak into our hearts. We can hear His voice. We hope that this message has implanted into your heart, dug roots into your heart, and that uh, it's changed you in some way. We hope that you reach out to us. If you have any questions, if you have any prayer requests or concerns, we, we're inviting you to please contact us with those things. Uh, we'd love to partner with you, come alongside you, and walk with you in this journey.